this morning. Thank you, Karen. Malachi chapter 2 this morning. We're going to be looking at Malachi chapter 2 again. I want to remind you, we do things a little different today. Uh, at the close of the service, we won't have a public invitation time, but we have a special song that's going to prepare our hearts, I pray, to partake from the Lord's table. If you feel a need to respond to today's message in any way, please catch me after the service. I would love to talk with you about how God is working in that. Again, uh, for those up there, I think Lee's going to take care of being sure we've got uh, what you need to partake uh, from the Lord's table today. We're going to be looking in just a moment in Malachi chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. The other evening, I believe it was uh, Independence Day, as you're turning there, Karen and I uh, just decide to have a quiet evening. No fireworks uh, displays or anything like that are going into uh, other areas. We just decided to stay at home. And while we were home, we were looking for what was showing on television that night. And uh, we turned over to Turner Classic Movies and saw the movie The Music Man, which was an adaptation of a play by the same name. It was written by Meredith Wilson, I believe, in the late 1940s. This particular movie was produced in 1962, uh, and the lead actors were Shirley Jones, who was the mother of the Partridge family, if you're my generation, and uh, Robert Preston, who I believe also was the actor in the, uh, the play version of that. But you may remember the story. It's the story of a man named Harold Hill who was a traveling salesman and con man. And simply put, Harold Hill uh, made his living by deceiving people and his deception was in a particular area. He would travel into various towns by train and he would convince people that he was an accomplished musician. The reality was he couldn't even read music. But as he convinced a particular town, he would uh, present to the parents that their children could be part of a great band and do great things. And so he would convince the children and the parents to buy uh, the uniforms and to buy the instruments. And then he would conveniently leave town without ever leading one performance. Well, the story begins in The Music Man with Harold Hill uh, arriving rather in this Midwestern town in Iowa. I think it was River City was what it was called. And uh, he began uh, through a process to endear himself to a woman who seemed unapproachable and uh, was very influential. But eventually the people in the town began to find out that his deal was really a scam. And so right near the climax of that movie, you're thinking the whole house of cards is falling on Harold Hill when miraculously this band comes together, the parents are proud, and he returns in the good graces of that small town. That is Broadway and that is Hollywood, but it's not often real life. Because uh, the reality of the matter is this, often bad leadership leads to bad fellowship. When, when a leadership is corrupt, usually uh, what results from that's not good. And that's what we see here in Malachi chapter 2. Look with me, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, this decree is for you, priests, that is, the spiritual leaders in that day, if you do not listen and if you do not take to heart to honor my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse among you. I will curse your blessings. In fact, I have already begun to curse them because you're not taking it to heart. Look, I am going to rebuke your descendants, and I will spread animal waste over your faces, the waste from your festival sacrifices, and you'll be taken away with it. Then you will know that I sent you this decree so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave these to him. It called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and fairness and turned many from sin. 
For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge and people should seek instruction from his mouth because he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. You, on the other hand, have turned from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have violated the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. So I, in turn, have made you despised and humiliated before all the people because you are not keeping my ways but are showing partiality in your instruction. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word today and as we prepare our hearts for this table, I pray, Lord, that we would inspect our lives. Father, that our motives, that our hearts would be pure before you. And Father, that we would acknowledge you as our great and perfect high priest, having offered the perfect sacrifice of your very life. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me remind you, if you've been with us, that this book, this four-chapter book in the Old Testament is known as an oracle. In fact, the second word in the book is the word oracle, which speaks to a burden. And the prophet had a burden because things were not all good uh, in Malachi's day. And among the multiple issues of these people who lived after the return from the exile uh, was this, the leadership was poor. The priests were not men of God. They were deficient. They were to be intermediaries. They were to be examples for the people of Israel. They were expected to be role models in godliness, and they were anything except that. And so this morning, I want to look at these shortcomings, these sins of the leaders, the priests in Malachi's day. But before we partake of communion, hopefully we'll all agree that our great high priest, who just was sung about, the greatest, is the perfect sacrificer. And because he offered himself as the perfect sacrifice. But first, I want to look at the deficiencies of these priests in Malachi's day. And the first thing I want you to note with me as we look at these verses it is this. The priest in Malachi's day did not honor God in their work. You might say, well, why is God telling them this? Well, we understood from last week there were problems among the people of Israel. And it was this. The people were bringing unacceptable, second-rate things to the altar of the Lord. They were bringing deformed animals. They were bringing stolen animals. They were bringing their second best to the Lord. And God spoke very sternly to the people and said that he would rebuke them. They were offering these unacceptable sacrifices, and the problem was this today. It was the priests who were accepting these sacrifices. They had lowered the standards of the office. Instead of saying, that is a deformed animal, not acceptable, instead of saying, this is your second best and not acceptable, they were just endorsing and rubber stamping these unacceptable sacrifices the people were offering. And so basically the sacrifice would go in this particular order. It would come from the person or the family through to the priest, to the altar, and then understood that that altar and sacrifice would be a pleasing, acceptable aroma unto the Lord. But what was not acceptable was being offered, and the priests were allowing it to happen. And sin was leading to a decline in the priestly office in Malachi's day. You know, sin has that effect in our lives. There's a destructive element to it. It brings us down. It makes us less spiritually. And as we look at these priests in Malachi's day, the priesthood was not always that way. In fact, we see in these very verses, in verses 4 and 5, that God mentions their forefather, Levi, and that Levi was accepted in God's sight. And while Levi was not perfect, he had many positive attributes. Verse 5 tells us that Levi revered God, that he stood in awe of God. Verse 6, that he had true instruction, that he walked with God, that he walked with integrity, and he turned many uh, from their iniquities. In other words, Levi was a godly man. He was carrying out the duty. If Levi had lived in that day and someone were to bring something unacceptable and try to offer it as something acceptable to God, Levi would have said, no way. He taught the people rightly. 
And so as we look at it, we see all of these wonderful things about Levi, but the problem is over time, the priesthood declined and the people began to accept what is second best. And so what was God's answer? It was to repent. And whenever we find sin in our lives, the answer is not to cover it up, not to kick the can down the road, but to repent. Why did God want them to repent? So that God's covenant with Levi would continue. If they did not repent, God would cut their line. Notice what it says in verse 3. He says, I am going to rebuke your descendants. In other words, it was through Levi and through Aaron that the priestly order would come. And what he was saying is in regard to you, priests of Malachi's day, your descendants will not be able to offer the sacrifices. It's very interesting. He says after that, I will spread also in verse three, I will spread animal waste over your faces. Now we look at that in our culture today and we say that's gross and it is gross. But what he literally meant then was he would disqualify them from the office of the priesthood because if they had uh, uh, the, the, the animal waste on their face, they would be considered unclean, thus unacceptable ceremonially to offer the sacrifices. And so God is saying, if you do not repent and adjust your way to my ways, I'll bypass you. I'll keep the covenant with Levi, but it won't be through you. And so we see here that these priests were unfit for service. But I want you to see a second aspect. They failed to instruct the people. Now, you know, the priestly office was very interesting. The prophetic office was to represent God to the people. The prophet would speak the words of God to the people. The priestly office is unique from that. Primarily, the priest would represent the people to God. He would be the intermediary. He would be the one that would offer the sacrifice in order to uh, connect the people with God. But that wasn't the only responsibility of the priest. He also would represent God to the people, specifically providing instruction. In fact, in Deuteronomy 33.10, it says that they, those from Levi, would teach the ordinances to Jacob, the instruction to Israel. Yet we see in verse 7 that that didn't change. It was still that way because verse 7 in our text says, For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge. The priests were to define what God's law was, what was acceptable. They were actually to carry forth the truth of the word of God unaffected by anything. In fact, they were much like that special glass that people see today. When, when you have a special document that you want to frame, maybe a diploma or something, and they say, well, you can get the regular glass, or you can have this glass that protects the document from ultraviolet rays over the years, and most of the time, we would get that special glass. Why? Because we want the document preserved as it is for, for as long as possible. And so the priests here, they were called to uphold the standard of God, to guard that standard, to not change. And that's the responsibility of the church today. We're to uphold God's standard. We're not to follow what people are offering in the world today. What is unacceptable, saying it's acceptable. What is wrong, saying it's right. That's not the responsibility of the church. Our responsibility is to uphold the truth of God's word and his standard. The priest didn't do that, not in Malachi's day, and we see the result of it. The result was this, you have caused many to stumble. So the priest couldn't say, well, it's just my business, I'm doing no. Their disobedience had a rippling effect. And when the church is not being what the church needs to be, we're held responsible for not upholding that standard. Because if a standard is not set, how do people know what to shoot for? And so these priests didn't uphold the standard. And then I want you to see a third thing about the priests. Simply put, they served themselves. They were living for themselves. The Old Testament book of Jude, the second to last chapter in the Bible, Jude sets out to write for another purpose, but then he says, 
I need to contend for the faith. And so he writes against the false teachers, the quote unquote leaders, uh, many of which were in his day. And as you go through Jude, and I know our ladies went through that Bible study, and what a great Bible study I'm sure it was back in the spring. But it talked about the various attributes of false teachers. It's like, how can we identify these false teachers? You can go through Jude and you can see the, the, the characteristics so that you know what's counterfeit. But one of the things that describes the leaders that were false in Jude, Jude's day was in verse 12. It says, they're shepherds who feed only themselves. Don't feed the sheep. They feed only themselves. Called to serve God first and then the people. They choose option three. They serve themselves. That's what was happening in Malachi's day. These priests were first to serve God and then to serve the people. Yet instead, he says in verse 9, he says, so I in turn have made you despised and humiliated before all the people. Why? Because you are not keeping my ways, but doing what? Showing partiality in your instruction. So when people were coming through, they weren't upholding the standard of God and letting the chips fall wherever they may. But as each person would come, they would make a judgment, not based on what was right with God, but they would be partial to some. So we know, and it doesn't take long to realize what was happening. They were lowering their standards for people of influence. If someone came and they could offer them something on the side, or if they were in a position of influence and the priest could personally gain from allowing what was second best, they were doing that. And that conduct was a stench to God. God despised it. They were going through the ritual and their hearts were far from God. What could they do? Repent. And the fact that God is even addressing them in chapter 2 says that it's not too late. He's calling the people to repent. And when sin is in our lives, repentance is the godly response. And if these priests did not repent, God would bypass them. They would be judged. So we see things weren't good in Malachi's day. The leaders weren't leading. The people were still following. And just like someone who was a leader leading down the wrong path in the wilderness, that's what was happening. They needed a wake-up call, and God was giving it to them. But today, we prepare to partake from the Lord's table. And as we partake from the Lord's table... I want to do just a brief comparison between these priests and our great high priest, Jesus Christ. Wouldn't it have been terrible to have lived in the days of Malachi when the leaders were unacceptable to God, when they were accepting things that were not right and we were following that? That would have been a terrible day. But as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table, our great high priest is the greatest. He's perfect. So I want to look at a brief comparison of Jesus to these priests. Jesus' priesthood is of a higher order. We see that these priests here were connected to Levi. And Levi was given the responsibility, basically, of overseeing the operations of the tabernacle and then the temple. And part of that, through the Aaronic uh, line, came the priesthood. But, but as we look at this, Jesus is our great high priest, but he did not come from the tribe of Levi. He came from the tribe of Judah. So how could he be our high priest? Well, he is God. And we're explained, or it's explained to us in Hebrews chapter 7, that Jesus was of a different order, a higher order of priesthood than that of Levi. He was of the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is described in Genesis, I believe, around chapter 14. And we don't have time to go in depth to everything about Melchizedek. 
in comparing it to the order of Levi, but there are two things I think that are important to note. And the first is this, the order of Melchizedek is an eternal order. In fact, uh, Levitical priests, those that came from Levi, Levi uh, uh, came uh, and, and carried out the law, all right? They would live and they would die and then someone would succeed. And then that one would die and someone would succeed. And even as when we studied the, 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 the kings and uh, the, the nation of Judah in our study back in the spring, there would be some good and some bad. And so really Levi himself was commended of God here, but his descendants were not. But the order of Melchizedek is different. Hebrews 7 and verse 17 says of Jesus, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And so the Levitical order was great and it served a purpose, but the order of Melchizedek is greater and Jesus was of that order. But I want you to see a second truth in this comparison. Melchizedek preceded and superseded Levi. He was greater. His order was greater. And follow this reasoning. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Abraham gave his tithe to Melchizedek. Now we know that Abraham was forefather to whom? Levi. So we would say Abraham was greater than Levi. Levi came later. Abraham offered his tithe to Melchizedek. And so thus the greater would bless the lesser because Melchizedek blessed Abraham, but also the lesser would give through the greater. And so here was Melchizedek who predated Levi, who himself received the offering from the forefather of Levi. And so the order of Melchizedek is greater, which tells us what? Simply put this, Jesus is the perfect, great, eternal sacrifice. In fact, elsewhere in Hebrews, it says the animals that were offered, uh, they did not ever cover that sin. It is only the blood of Christ that covers your sin. Well, further in this comparison, what about Jesus? He pleased the Father with this sacrifice. He pleased him. You see, those in Malachi's day, here comes the second raid, and they'd say, okay, just let it through. What about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? His body would be the sacrifice. And his humanness was pleading out, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. In other words, Jesus would be that gate. He would be the one that would decide the sacrifice. And that part of him understanding how great the suffering would be, he'd say, if there's any other way, if there's any other type of sacrifice, let it be. But he said, and he resolved in this, no, the perfect sacrifice of my body will be that. He was both the sacrifice in the one offering the sacrifice. What about how Jesus taught? Jesus taught rightly in Matthew 5, 17. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He says in John 7, 16, my teaching isn't mine, but the one who sent me. You see, the priests in Malachi's day, they were teaching what was convenient for them. Jesus was teaching the truth of God. But what about whom Jesus served. Jesus served the Father and he served people, unlike those in Malachi's day who served themselves. Hebrews 4.14 4 says, therefore, since we have a great high priest, who, by the way, has passed through the heavens, not an earthly temple, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to the confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so we may receive mercy and find grace to help at the proper time. So you say, Pastor, why these Old Testament sacrifices? They pointed to a greater sacrifice, the unblemished Son of God. The payment was not in those animals, 
because the scripture says that if they could have paid the price, why would they have been made year after year, day after day, one after the other? They were pointing to the great sacrifice who's Jesus. Aren't you glad that we're living under the priesthood of Jesus, a perfect high priest? Would you bring your life to him today and say, I give my life as a living sacrifice to you? Would you follow him and say, Lord Jesus, I want to be a disciple of you. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died and you're the perfect sacrifice for me, acceptable to the Father, not second rate, but God's only begotten Son. I trust in you as my sacrifice that I might be right with God. If you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the most important decision you can do is to give your heart to him. The excellent one, the one who always lives to intercede, always righteous, the perfect sacrifice. We're going to close a little differently today. We're not going to have a formal invitational hymn. We almost always do that. But the reason is this. I ask you to prepare your heart for a greater invitation to come to the table of the Lord. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then the scripture teaches that you're Welcome to this table. If not, wouldn't you believe on him today? As we come to this table, I ask that you do prepare your hearts. And you know, as we think about Jesus, he's the great sacrifice and the great sacrificer. But you know who offered that sacrifice. It was not just any Jewish family. It was our Heavenly Father who offered his own son, who offered us such a great love. So we have a song that's going to be sung. You don't have to sing it. I pray you'll meditate. I want you to contemplate. I want you to think about the love of God who finding his people just as in Malachi's day in need of a perfect sacrifice had such a love for us that he gave his very son. So Tony and Addie are going to sing. After they sing, then we're going to uh, prepare our hearts to partake from the table.